Warriors Don't Cry by Melba Patillo Beals, Chapter 16. I did it, I shouted with excitement as I raced in the front door where Grandma India was standing in her usual place to welcome me home after school. Did what? she asked. I tried to do some of the things Gandhi talks about. You know, keeping calm in your own mind, no matter what's going on outside. Phone's for you, Melba, Conrad yelled from the hallway. I hoped it would be someone I could share my victory with, maybe Vince. But it was Link. I slammed the receiver down. Right away, the phone started to ring again. I picked, it, I picked up and said, Don't bother to call again. I slammed the receiver down once more. Again, it rang and rang. Grandma walked into the hallway and eyed me suspiciously. I picked up the receiver for fear of having to explain to her. Five minutes, that's all I asked, Link said. I saved your skin, at least you owe me a chance to explain. Absolutely not, I said, but he cut me off before I could finish. I didn't want to be there, but I heard they were going to do something big to you in the cafeteria, so I thought if I was there, I could do something to help you. How did you know they were planning something? My dad makes me go to those meetings where they plan what to do to get you all kicked out of school. Why are you telling me this? Because I want to help you. I can't trust you after today. Hey, if I hadn't convinced those guys to leave, they were going to get you. And if you don't believe I'm on your side, here's proof. Listen up. Stay off the far end of the second floor tomorrow and don't go to your locker after lunch. I gotta go. Grandma wants me. She was standing over me looking as though she was upset with me. I rushed to the kitchen with her following on my heels. I had to tell them what was had happened and it was only a matter of minutes before mother and grandma tore, me, tore into me. Mother Lois was first to speak. We have to wonder about Link's motives. Then Grandma said, Perhaps he's trying to set you up for the clan. He's going to lure you into a trap, and then where will you be? Although I, too, was undecided about trusting Link, I continued to defend Link as both of them came up with dozens of reasons why I shouldn't trust this, wise, this white boy. Still, there, were, there was something inside me that said he had taken a big risk giving me his car that day. I didn't want to defy mother and grandma, but Link was inside Central. He understood what I was going through. They could not help me inside that school. I had no choice but to take any help that would enable me to survive. I had to take the risk of trusting Link a little bit, at least for now. The next day, I heeded Link's warnings, taking a different route to class. Later, I heard there was trouble on the route I usually took. By not going to my locker in the afternoon, I avoided meeting someone who must have been very angry as he or she broke the lock and shredded the contents of the locker. The day had gone exactly as Link had said it would. But even so, I found myself wondering if he were only building my trust in order to lay a bigger trap for me. Link warned me that with the beginning of April, segregationists would feel compelled to speed up their efforts in order to get us out of Central before we could complete a full school year. Some of their tactics became desperate, and their desperation made it easier for me to avoid the more obvious traps they set. In the days that followed, Link continued to phone me every night. Grandma India would hand me the receiver with a scowl on her face, but neither she nor Mother Lois forbade my talking with him. Sometimes Grandma would, e would even stood by listening to the entire conversation with, folded, with arms folded and a huffy attitude. It was the first time I had ever continued to do something I knew they didn't want me to do. I think Mother finally realized that Link was doing something for me they could not do, feeding me vital information that could help me survive. Link swore me to secrecy, so other than mother and grandmother, none of the other seven students knew he existed. Occasionally, during a general conversation about do's and don'ts, I would share some information that I thought would be helpful to them. But otherwise, I kept my mouth shut. I figured I owed Link that. 
After a while, having him as my friend got to be fun for both of us. We played a cloak and dagger game, passing notes and books and such. But we never spoke to each other in school, or walked near each other, or acknowledged each other except for our eyes for fear he would get caught. He continued hanging around with Andy and his friends and attending the segregationist strategy meetings. He said the worst part of it for him was that he felt himself a traitor. He was torn between his loyalty to his family and friends and his sense of guilt and responsibility for what ha was happening to the eight of us. Sometimes he justified what he was doing by saying he was, if he protected me and prevented a major catastrophe from befalling any of the eight of us, he could ensure some of his normal graduation activities. And besides, people wouldn't think Central such an awful place. Meanwhile, we did indeed notice some stronger efforts by a few teachers to discipline students. The Little Rock School Board now demanded belligerent students be brought under control. At first we saw no difference, but we began to notice a slight bit of peace in the hallways, and we were heartened to hear that another girl had been expelled for handing out the card saying, one down, eight to go. Easter, what a wonderful word. I thought to myself as I walked to Grandma's room, if Easter Sunday was coming soon, it meant the end of school was only weeks away. The 29th of May, what would the last day of school at Central High be like? Tonight's the night, Grandma said, making the announcement from her perch in her favorite chair. We're going into the trunks tonight. It's time to make your selections. She smiled with her all-knowing expression because she was fully aware of how much it delighted us to view and touch her trunk treasures. There were gifts, heirlooms, and mementos we got to touch or see only at Christmas or Easter. There they were in the center of the room, the old trunks given to Grandma India as a young girl. One was a deep brown with scrapes and scratches visible beneath the glossy veneer she kept up with biannual waxing. The second one was a deep garnet color and looked newer. Have you given much thought to what you'll be wearing to church this Easter, Melba? Grandma India asked as she lifted the lid of the first trunk. I had thought long and hard about wanting to dress grown up. The strength growing inside me to face the hostile students at Central had leaked into my home life. Now it bubbled up in me, allowing me to speak my mind. I'd like to wear nylon stockings and a little heels with whatever I wear. I'm 16 now, 16 and a half actually. It was a daring suggestion, considering Grandma's opinion on this subject. Nylon stocking and heels. Have you been reading those trashy fashion magazines again? Let's not move too fast, young lady. You've got all your life to wear stockings, but you'll only be young once. Grandma seemed adamant about my remaining a two-year-old, I thought to myself. It was the only thing she and Papa Will agreed on. He thought wearing nylon stockings and dating should be begin at age 20, but since he didn't live with us, I knew what he thought wouldn't have to be the rule for what happened in my life. But Grandma was right there, keeping me from growing up. Nevertheless, as she fussed and fumed about my wicked desires, I kept my expression pleasant, the same as I did in the halls of Central High School in order to avoid expulsion. Let's take some time to think about the stockings, Mother Lois said, smiling and moving toward the trunk to peek inside. Tonight we'll pick our special cloth from the trunks and get going on a design for all of our dresses and for Conrad's shirt. Lois, maybe something two-piece would be nice for Melba this year, Grandma said. Mama and Grandma would draw a picture, then sit in the middle of the floor and cut a pattern out of the newspaper and make a dress come to life in the fabric. For the next hour, we rummaged through Grandma's trunks filled with fabrics she had collected over the years. There were remnants of dresses and suits I had seen her wear all my life. There were brand new pieces and full bolts she had gotten from her mother before she died or from her sisters as trades for other things. Easter was always a time when we each were allowed to choose the cloth we wanted. Celebrating the Easter holiday was a big event in our family. Attending church on Easter was a grand ceremony when everybody dressed up in the very best they could afford. There were always an Easter egg hunt on the church grounds and a parade of people in special hats. A few weeks back, we had officially begun the sacred holiday with the pledge of our sacrament sacrifices for Lent. 
It was a family tradition that Mama and Grandma would review our Lenten commitments as we shopped the trunks. Have you two considered adding more items to your sacrifice list this year? Grandma asked as she began to sketch the design for my dress. Uh, great bet colas, that's what I'm doing without. I haven't slipped yet, I declared, remembering how many times I'd thought about slipping. That's all? Grandma's tone let me know. She wasn't pleased with either the number or quality of sacrifices on my list. One year I had chosen to give up the radio and another candy bars. I knew for sure I would never promise to give up either of those things again. Well, what about giving up television to spend more time reading your Bible, Grandma said. Oh, Mother, Grandmother, please, since I'm giving up so much in Central, can't you let my me slide by, by this year? I pleaded with them as I sat caressing the thick folded piece of purple velvet I had pulled from the trunk. There's lots of hard work to be done on repenting for sins. Have you listed your sins? As Grandma spoke, she rocked back and forth a little faster and turned her attention away from her sketching to look at me. I've lumped together into one big sin all the hundreds of times I thought evil of people at Central, I said. There were also several times I thought about sassing adults back, mostly teachers and principals at school, and I didn't trust God on two occasions. And how about not answering all your fan mail, Mother Lois added. Don't you think it's a sin to ignore all those people who take their valuable time to write to you? You were so good about it at first. I realized she was right. At the beginning, I had faithfully answered those letters each week. They came from France, Germany, England, Africa, and Australia, from people all around the world, mostly congratulating me for going to Central High. Grandma would sift out the mean ones, which were few and far between. I got several marriage proposals from cute boys, some of them white, who sent their pictures. Grandma forbade me to send them more than a polite thank you. I wanted at least to learn more about them and file them in a if-you-need-a-husband-when-you're-grown-up file. But Grandma said that would be a personal sin. Late one evening, Link telephoned. He was furious about the announcement of the cancellation of many of his senior class activities. He spoke of all his hard work to maintain good grades, his athletic awards, and his student leadership, and now his hopes for a wonderful senior year were dashed. The traditional senior events had been canceled because of the possibility of trouble as a result of integration. School officials also cited the presence of the Arkansas National Guard as another reason. Link was inconsolable. I don't know what I can do about it, I said, even as I wondered whether his disappointment and anger would make him turn against me. You can do a news interview saying we're not such bad people and that everything is b getting better at school. That way, everybody in the world won't think we're all villains. Link, you don't want me to lie, do you? Everything is getting worse, not better. On and on he went, telling me how Central High students were suffering and sacrificing the reputation of their nationally acclaimed school because we had come there. He was more angry than I'd ever heard him. This was a good school, ranked high on the national scale, and now our halls are filled with soldiers and people are threatening or treating us like criminals. I could only think to tell him to have faith that God would make things okay. I couldn't do what he asked. I couldn't change things. That's when he really got sarcastic, saying, don't give me that God stuff. That's what Nana Healy always says. I don't believe in God. If he's there, why is he letting all this happen? Who's Nana Healy? My nanny. She's colored like you. He had often spoke of her, but this was the first time he had told me she was not white. The reason I'm attending Central is so I don't have to spend my life being somebody's nanny, I said, in a tone to match his indignation, indignant manner. By the end of the conversation, Link's anger had shifted from me to the situation. He was frustrated, vowing he was going to do something about the cancellation. Our conversation aroused my suspicion anew. Was he just being nice to me temporarily to get me to lie to the newspeople? Who was he? After all, I had no way of checking him out. I couldn't tell the others about him or talk about him to the NAACP people. I was at his mercy, having to decide on my own whether or not he was genuine. I would have to be on constant alert from now on, 
watching for signs of what his real motives were. But meanwhile, he warned me to watch out for any students who tried to hand me election pamphlets. School officers were to be elected on April 24th. Students would be nice and offer us literature, he said, but as we paused to take it, they would ink our dress, grab our books, or worse. I've been to some of those planning meetings recently, and I can tell you they're going to pull out all the stops and do everything they can to get you all out of school before it ends, to make certain you're not coming back next year. What more could they do? They're already exhausting us. Yeah, but it's going to get much worse. The thing is, lately they've been talking about pulling off something really big that will not only hurt you, but your families. Something that will force you to quit. Back at school on Monday, just as Link had warned, people approached us as though they were including us in the election process. They would offer a pamphlet with one hand while using the other hand to shower us with all manner of smelly liquids. Sometimes they would kick or even punch us and... Usually, what, whatever they did was followed by rude name-calling. The elections at our old school, Horace Mann, weren't nearly so sophisticated. At Central, people put up signs, wore buttons, and passed out material just as, as though it were a real election. They held debates and voting parties and did all manner of campaigning. I was intrigued watching the process, delighted at the complexity of it all. Compared to what I had ex had been accustomed to, at our old school. It made me extra sad that I wasn't allowed to participate. More frequently now, Link was full of talk about graduation events. Under any circumstances, this would have been an exciting time of year, filled with wonderful events. He told me about the parties for the juniors and seniors. He told me about huge gala at the Marion Hotel and said the junior and senior picnics at Central High were better than Christmas and New Year's combined. It made me feel more isolated because now I was also left out of the events at my old high school. As our conversations grew more relaxed, Link began telling me about his parents. His father, a wealthy and very well-known businessman, had been forced to contribute money to the Citizens Council campaign in order to do a healthy amount of business in Little Rock. He isn't for race mixing, but he also isn't for beating up anybody's children, Link explained. Judge Lemley to hear school board petition, Arkansas Gazette, Tuesday, April 22nd, 1958. As I read the article, I felt despair creeping over me. Judge Harry Lemley of Hope, Hope, Arkansas had been named to hear the Little Rock School Board's petition asking for a postponement of integration for public schools. The first hearing was set for the following Monday at 9.30 a.m. He promised the final hearing would be held long before September. September. The article described him as a native of Upperville, Virginia, and a man who loved the South, as though it were a religion. It was evident from that description that he wouldn't be likely to violate Southern tradition for my people. I desperately needed the break that came with the Easter holiday. As usual, on Easter Sunday morning, each of us twirled and pranced in our family fashion show. Spiffy do, Grandma India said as we climbed into the car. The church was filled to the rafters with people we didn't see during all the rest of the year. Vince and I sat together at the church dinner, reminiscing about our earlier dates, and for the first time I felt as though we were good friends again. Still, he was not someone with whom I could talk about my Central High experience. We had simply drifted apart because we had so little in common except our past relationship. In my diary, I wrote, I'm happy today, but I am also frightened. The appointment of Lemley means we have to pray hard. This is not supposed to happen in America. I mean, segregationists aren't supposed to be able to have their own judge. I salute the flag every morning as I look at a picture on the homeroom wall directly in front of me. I'll never forget that picture as long as I live. It is a brown pasture with white sheep. As the boys behind me call names and the girls to each side sneer, I look straight ahead because those sheep are smiling at me. I think it's a smile from God. It is a promise that if I salute the flag like a good American, all these integration problems will be worked out eventually. <laughs>